So um, as you heard from Roberto, the Ehlers-Danlos syndrome is actually a spectrum of monogenic disorders with a wide range of phenotypic severity. The definition really depends on the affectation of the joints, the skin, and other types include blood vessels and internal organs to varying degrees. Now, several forms are caused by defects in one of the fibrillar collagens or of enzymes involved in processing the fibrillar collagens, but recent research has identified multiple other mechanisms. <coughs> there biosynthesis of other molecules in the extracellular matrix and molecules involved in intracellular trafficking and secretion and assembly of the extracellular matrix molecules. So we're starting to see a very, very wide spectrum of genes involved in the etiology of these disorders. So the fibrillar collagens are the major structural component of the extracellular matrix, and they've, they've got these Roman numerals, and that's actually been a source of some uh, confusion because we had numbers for the types of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and numbers for the types of collagen and it's been, it's been confusing. So the addition of names for the types of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome I think has been very helpful. The main thing to know about these fibrillar collagens is that they're triple helical molecules. They're made up of three chains that wrap up together. And these three chains may be identical or they may be genetically distinct, and they're called the alpha chains. So, um, is this a point? Yeah. so you can see over here uh, these three chains are kind of wrapped up um, into like a rope. And they, they uh, after they're synthesized inside the cell, they coalesce at the carboxy terminal chain and then they wrap up together and they form this, what this is called a pro-collagen, and then these two ends are cleaved off to form the mature collagen molecule. And those mature collagen molecules align to form the collagen fibril. So it's a really, it's a complex process. There are multiple steps involved, and there have been um, alterations found in pretty much every step. You know, basically, if something can go wrong, it will eventually. Um, this is the updated EDS classification as of 2012. And I would say don't spend a lot of time learning this because there's a new one coming from the International Symposium that was held in May, and that's going to be published in March of next year. So. <clears throat> Just starting with the classical type of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, when you see these legs, that's, you start thinking about classical EDS, these very, very um, atrophic scars and the scars up and down uh, the shins are quite typical of the classical type of EDS. And the other thing that we see in the skin is this very, very stretchy skin, which is very typical of classical Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. And work from um, Francisca Malfate and her colleagues in Ghent have shown that if you apply very strict clinical criteria, more than 90% of patients with the classical type of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome will have alterations in the genes that encode type 5 collagen. This is one of the fibrillar collagens. So um, this was from a paper that they published in 2012 uh, with 126 patients. And it just, they're, they're, this paper showed that if they define, they define the phenotype very strictly with the really very uh, typical scarring and typical stretchiness of the skin, that they will find those type 5 collagen mutations in more than 90%. So the last published criteria for classical Ehlers-Danlos syndrome included the major criteria of smooth, velvety, hyperextensible skin, the skin fragility with those, the splitting and slow wound healing, very widened atrophic scars, and joint hypermobility of the small and large joints. And there's a long list of minor criteria, including easy bruising, and you can read the rest of them here. But the point is, that the folks from Ghent found that if people had all three of these major criteria, 
they're more than 90% likely to have a type 5 collagen mutation. If they only have two, the probability goes way, way down. And so I have not been doing molecular testing on people who have only two of those criteria because the chances of finding a type 5 collagen gene mutation is very low. So <clears throat> there's another type of um, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome that's associated with tenacin X. This would go in, in the more rare category. It's an autosomal recessive type of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. The classical form is autosomal dominant, which means you need only a single copy of the type 5 collagen gene alteration in order to manifest. This tenacin X is re recessive. You need a copy from both parents. It also has marked joint hyperextensibility, easy bruising, and joint laxity, but these patients lack the atrophic scarring and poor wound healing that's typical of the classical type. Other medical problems that's seen in this disorder include severe diverticular intestinal disease, mitral valve prolapse, often requiring valve replacement, and obstructive airway disease can also be seen in these folks. And um, this might be included in the differential, actually, even of the vascular type of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, so it's something to, that kind of has to be considered in the differential. Now, in 2003, um, there was a paper that looked at people who had carried one copy of the tenacin X mutations, and they had generalized joint hypermobility in about 45 percent of them, but none had skin hyperextensibility or easy bruising. So <coughs> people were thinking, well, maybe this is going to be the answer to hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. But <coughs> when a study was done looking at 80 patients with hypermobile EDS, only two were found to have mutations in this tenacin X gene. So it turns out that it is a player, but it's a minor player in the hypermobile EDS arena. Now the vascular type of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome um, is caused by mutations in type 3 collagen. This is another one of the fibrillar collagens. And, um, we will find alterations on sequence analysis in type 3, the gene encoding type 3 collagen in 95 percent of the time. If an uh, alteration is not seen on sequencing, in the laboratory they do a process that we call deletion duplication analysis, looking for um, regions that have been either deleted or copied, and about 2 percent of the time that will unearth a mutation. And recent work from Dr. Peter Byers' lab has shown some very interesting uh, things, that the severity of the phenotype actually depends upon the type of mutation that's present. It's not just you have a type 3 collagen alteration and therefore you have vascular Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. The phenotype varies. So, this is just to say that uh, type 3 collagen is a homotrimer. It's encoded by one gene, the COL3A1 gene, and all three chains in the triple helix are encoded by that one gene. So this is the paper from Dr. Byers' lab showing that survival is affected by the mutation type and the mechanism. And because of the vascular complications in Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, we know that mortality is definitely reduced. People um, have life-threatening complications at an early age. But um, this paper showed that depending on the type of mutation and the uh, nature of the amino acid that's involved in the mutation, the uh, severity can be very very different. Um, so we now have to look at the specific nature of that mutation in order to make a prognosis and to discuss a plan with affected patients. 
Okay, the kyphoscoliotic type of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, these are patients who present with uh, kyphoscoliosis in the very, very early age, you know, in the neonatal period. They have generalized joint laxity, skin fragility. They have severe problems with muscle tone at birth. And the mutation in this case, this is an autosomal recessive condition. It's a deficiency of an enzyme that puts a, hyd uh, a hydroxylation, lysyl hydroxylase, um, on the, the uh, lysine in the um, collagen molecule. So the gene is called PLOD1. And uh, why do we need this enzyme? Well, those hydroxylysine um, residues serve as an attachment point for the galactose, these sugars, the galactose and glucogalactose. Um, and they act as a place where the, the molecules can kind of cross-link in assembling the fibrils that I showed you earlier. So you see here, the, you can put OHs and galactose OHs on the assembled, on, on the um, monomers of the collagen molecule, and then they uh, play an important role in the assembly. The arthrochalasia type. Again, this is one of the more rare types. The patients have bilateral hip dislocations. So whenever we see a baby with bilateral hip dislocations in what looks like an Ehlers-Danlos phenotype, we have to think about arthrochalasia. The skin is typically doughy. It's described as doughy and redundant, and there are contractures of the fingers and toes. Not uncommon for them to have umbilical hernias. And again, you may have kyphosis in these children and the muscular hypotonia. <coughs> this disorder is caused by mutations in type 1 collagen. And it, the, it can be in the alpha 1 chain or the alpha 2 chain of type 1 collagen. But they interfere with the cleavage of the N propeptide. And these are autosomal dominant mutations. So uh, just going back here, so this is um, cleavage of the N-propeptide. And if, if we can't cleave that part, then these fibrils are not going to assemble properly. The dermatosporaxis type, um, these children have epicanthal folds, downsloping palpebral fissures. They have blue sclerae, the whites of the eyes look blue, um, micrognathia, prominent lips, and facial scarring is common, and they also have easy bruising. You can see this little fellow has a bruise right there. And this is caused by um, mutations in the gene that encodes the enzyme that does that same cleavage. So the arthro, uh, arthrochalasia type is the part that um, are mutations in the procollagen gene itself, and this is mutations in the enzyme that cleaves at the same location. So mutations, in, and this is then an autosomal recessive condition because the enzyme is affected. So the type 1 collagen is a heterotrimer. You have alpha 1 and alpha 2 chains. And then in both of these conditions, you're losing the ability to cleave this N-propeptide, one from losing the site of the enzyme in the collagen molecule, and the second one losing the enzyme ability to do the same job. Okay, musculocontractural type. This is um, malar hypoplasia, down slanting palpebral fissures, blue sclerae, microcornea, long philtrum. These people have an exaggerated jaw, so the macrognathia and, and a somewhat pointed chin. And this is caused by mutations in another enzyme called dermatophore-sulfotransferase, which is a key in enzyme in the synthesis of dermatin sulfate. And this is a, a glycoprotein, a very important glycoprotein in the connective tissue. So just another player in the connective tissue type. The cardiac valvular type, again, hypermo hypermobility of the joints, hyperextensible skin, and valvular insufficiency, and this is caused by a lack of the alpha-2 chain of type 1 collagen. 
And there are many other types uh, now that have been uh, reported, and there will be a full description of these coming from the International Symposium that was held last May. They're going to be published in an upcoming uh, issue of the American Journal of Medical Genetics. This will be published in March. There are a number of laboratories that are now offering the ability to do molecular testing. Uh, connective gene, tissue gene tests offers a number of next generation sequencing panel. The Greenwood Genetic Center offers, uh, the, I think there are about 32 genes on this panel. And um, GeneDx and another a new, new company called Invite both have large panels with all the known genes causing hereditary disorders of connective tissue. So it is possible with these next generation sequencing tests to do a, a big panel of genes and ascertain whether any of the known genes are the cause of the phenotype that we're seeing in the clinic. Now, <coughs> hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome is the most common form of Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, and it is the one for which we do not yet have a molecular cause. Many people are working on this. They're working really hard, and it's really to be hoped. I keep saying this, that, you know, within the next year, we'll have an answer to the molecular cause of hypermobile EDS. But management and evaluation is a very complex issue in hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome because we have um, joint and we have involvement of so many different organ systems. And you're going to hear in detail about these today from many specialists in, in these various areas. You just heard about musculoskeletal management um, in the previous talk. We have cardiovascular involvement with orthostatic intolerance, and Dr. Guzman will be talking about that. There can be valvular dysplasia. You'll be hearing a lot about the neurologic involvement, and there's a talk, uh, Dr. Liu will be speaking about gastrointestinal involvement. There's urologic involvement with multiple different possible diagnoses, and hematology and immunology are involved. So. Um, you know, the musculoskeletal involvement, the joint laxity, subluxations, dislocations, chronic musculoskeletal pain, frequent sprains. And to do the proper examination, we look at bite and score, that's a measure of joint hypermobility, the neck mobility, multiple other joints. And this is an image from EDS UK describing the bite and score, which is a nine point scale of joint hypermobility. The cardiovascular manifestations, again, the orthostatic intolerance, mitral valve prolapse. Aortic root dilation is usually not uh, clinically significant in the uh, hypermobile EDS population, but evaluation may include echocardiogram, a consideration of Holter monitor, and tilt table testing. And again, Dr. Guzman will be telling you more about that. Neurologic involvement can include headaches. Many, many, many different manifestations, and you have three talks later today which will detail all of this. Um, the uh, full neurologic examination, and if signs and symptoms of cervical medullary syndrome are present, we do an MRI in the upright position with flexion and extension of the neck, and urodynamic studies if tethered cord is suspected. And then if increased intracranial pressure is suspected and we have no other cause identified, uh, we may do an MRV or MR venogram to look for evidence of venous insufficiency. In the interest of time, and because I'm sure one of our later speakers is going to discuss it, I won't talk about the details of cervical medullary uh, syndrome. Gastrointestinal manifestations, I probably don't need to tell this audience about these. We have so many, IBS, bloating, abdominal pain, diarrhea, constipation, and uh, many others. So we look for evidence of bloating and organomegaly, bowel sounds, and also wonder about whether there are any vitamin uh, deficiencies. 
Important to remember that some GI manifestations may be related to mast cell activation, including the bloating, diarrhea, and food intolerance. The urologic features are many, and these may also be secondary to uh, mast cell activation in the bladder. And um, I think this involvement of hematology, allergy, and immunology is really relatively recent. Um, the recognition that there is a connection between mast cell activation and uh, hereditary disorders of connective tissue. So when patients describe hives, rashes, flushing, itching, frequent infections, severe allergies, uh, autoimmune conditions, and history of blood clots, we need our immunologic and hematolo hematologic colleagues uh, to help with the management of these uh, conditions. You've heard an excellent presentation on treatment strategies for musculoskeletal disorders. Um, for cardiovascular, you're going to hear about this from Dr. Guzman, so I, I will move on from there, and you're, you're going to hear about neurologic intervention from many others. Um, for the GI, uh, Dr. Liu will also be addressing this. So um, I think one of the most important things is that um, to remember that the proton pump inhibitors and the drugs that we use to decrease acidity in the stomach may result in vitamin deficiencies because we need that acidity in the stomach to absorb vitamin D and uh, many other vitamins. So um, we have to think about vitamin uh, deficiencies if we're using those drugs to decrease acidity. For the urology, pelvic floor PT can be extremely helpful. The mast cell protocol if interstic interstitial cystitis has been diagnosed. And um, think about tethered cord if there's evidence of a neurogenic bladder. Uh, for the mast cell uh, activation, we use H2 and H1 blockade. We stabilize the mast cells with chromalin sodium, use a low histamine diet. And I've been sending people to this uh, low histamine chef um, website because there's a lot of good information there about um, cooking with foods that do not elevate histamine levels. Other considerations in hematology uh, for people who have thrombosis or thrombophilia predispositions, they may need uh, anticoagulation. I've also been recommending this use of the WALS protocol by Dr. Terry Walls for autoimmune conditions. This is a dietary approach to autoimmunity, which is surprisingly effective in many patients. Um, some of the patients may need IVIG or plasmapheresis in the setting of serious autoimmune conditions, and um, we have to make sure that vitamin D levels are adequate. So um, coping. This is a really, really important aspect of living with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Cognitive behavioral therapy, mindfulness-based stress re reduction, biofeedback and neurofeedback, um, patient support groups and exercise all play a really important role in helping people live their fullest lives with uh, this condition. So that's a big, very, a lot of information. I'm sorry to try to cram it all into a relatively short time, but the message I want to give you is that it does take a village. No single <coughs> practitioner is going to be able to manage all these complicated uh, manifestations. And so the kind of clinic that Dr. Guzman, um, I'm sorry, Dr. Mendoza described to you and the uh, clinic that we're, we're still working on assembling um, in Baltimore are very, very important to provide multidisciplinary evaluation and management especially for patients with severe and unusual manifestations in multiple organ systems. So thank you very much for your attention, and I'd be happy to take some questions.